You know, one of the things that, and I, and I tell you right now, that's why the enemy really wants to attack this message tonight. Because I'm teaching on the ministration of Jesus, which is the operation of grace. Everything that Jesus operated out of was by the power of the Holy Spirit, which rested on him without measure. And the Holy Spirit gave him the words through the Father that were the ministry of grace, not the ministry of death. Remember, the law was a minister of death. The law could not make you and me upright. It could only judge. It could only condemn us. It could only show you what's wrong with you. And every time you thought about the law, you thought of condemnation. You were guilty. You were ashamed. You had to go before the people, lay out your sin offering. And that's not cool. If I said, everybody young full of sin, come up here tonight. Well, you wouldn't want to get up and come up here. Why? Because it's embarrassing. You'd like to be the one that sits back like a Pharisee and go, I don't have any sin. But God said they were all liars. Every man sins. Everyone falls short. It's facing that God lifted the curse of condemnation and brought revelation. And that's what you and I are to walk in. Now, in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, it says, but we, everybody say me, have this treasure in earthen vessels. So God is saying that he placed the truth, the grace, inside you. Now, therefore, your outside usually doesn't measure up to your inside. And so God's trying to get you to establish what he put inside to manifest outside. Can I get an amen? He said that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Do you realize that we always look at ourselves and we see, well, I'll, one day I'll be perfect. One day I'll be everything. And God said, you will never get any closer to perfection than you do to confess what God says is on the inside of you. We are troubled on every side. How many times do you feel like you got a bunch of trouble all around you? He said, yet we're not distressed. See, grace cancellation is where God will say, don't listen to the outside anymore. Listen to the inside. Listen to what I've deposited in you. You don't need to be stressed out. He said, we're perplexed, but not in despair. He said, pers persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest where? In our body. Let me tell you something. God is more for you than against you. He's trying to say, look up. Your redemption draws close. Quit considering your flesh. Quit considering the world. Quit considering your finances. And start considering the grace of God that calls you everything all right. He said, for we which are live, are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We have the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore I have spoken. We also believe, and therefore speak. See, when you start speaking by the spirit of grace and favor instead of speaking by the letter of the law and condemnation, then there's a transfer. You start saying, you know what? I think I like the position that God has for me, not the one I readily recognize. You cannot have what God says by doubt. The just live by. That means you don't doubt. That means you challenge the circumstances that are coming against you. Now, when you start opening your mouth, the reason most people won't do it is because God is saying, I have given you the ministry of grace, the ministry of reconciliation. Now, here I am coming to you telling you, look, I come from God to give you truth and help you. And my credit score is 490. I've blown it in every area of my life. I was an alcoholic. I was a drug addict. I was everything else and a bag of chips. 
I've got my name known in the, in the archives of all the law forces. And God says, what are you consulting that for? That's the dead man. I said you're going to accept what my position is, what I said you are. And you walk in it. Therefore, you have got to, by grace, say, ha ha. Everybody goes, ha ha. That means you open your mouth and you speak for the Lord. I represent Jesus. And he's told me he'll pardon you, he'll forgive you, he'll bless you. Do you have anything you need that I can pray for? Not saying, well, look, once you get out of that dog living and you stop all that this and this and that and that, that's the ministry of death. That's the ministry of condemnation. Nobody's going to come to you to get freedom if they know you're going to try to put them in bondage. Well, you just keep doing what you're doing. One day you'll come to me and know you're wrong. You'll tell me that. That won't ever bring someone closer to God. Because God does not judge you and me. He judged us at the cross. Therefore, you need to recognize, did I accept Jesus? Did I invite him into my heart? Did you? Then he crucified you. He's killed that old you. Now, the problem comes is we, when we preach, we either manifest ourselves or we manifest Jesus. You can tell a, a young novice or somebody's insecure, they're they, they, they just kind of afraid to tell them God will really set you free. I'll pray with you that God will. But almost the way you're presenting it, have you ever felt someone didn't, really know what they were saying or they weren't sure about what they were saying but they were trying to make you believe it huh it's easy to know that someone has good intentions but they really don't seem like they represent it. so they'll walk away and then you'll feel condemned because now the devil say see there you blew it man they couldn't receive from you and then you've got the minister of condemnation working again to push you down instead of lift you up when you start going out talking to people you're going to be a novice at it you're going to be kind of like, oh, what are they going to say if it don't work? Well, what just happens? What? And God said, there you go. You're, you're consulting the ministry of death. You're not consulting the spirit of life that I put inside you. I gave you power to tread over scorpions and serpents. And over all the power of the enemy, that in no way he can harm you, Bert. No way he can harm you, Frank. No way he can harm you, Steve. If God himself walked there and said that, you'd go, but if I say it, you go, well, you know, everybody's got a different way of doing stuff. <clears throat> and that's why they don't get what God says is theirs because they don't believe it. They know what's written in the Bible. They believe that part, but they can't receive it. See, if I manifest me to you, then I have to maintain you by me. And that's not going to keep you. See, if I teach you the one who is the way, the one who redeemed you, the one who fortifies his word, not mine. Then all of a sudden you start saying, I need that, God. I need your word. I need more knowledge. I need to enter into that place where, Lord God, I can see the kingdom and I can see the value and I can see the mercy and I can see the grace and I can see the love and I can see the forgiveness and I can empty myself out that fill me up. I would say fill me up. You know, when you get on a plane, you can take two bottles of water. You drink guzzle one down the tarmac. You stick it inside the little holder in front of you. And when you get up to 35,000 feet, that one that you drank and put the lid back on will crush. <laughs> wow. It'll implode. Why? Because the pressure on the outside is greater than the pressure on the inside. But if you get filled with the Holy Ghost and you pray in the Spirit and you build yourself up on your most holy faith, then the power on the inside is greater than the power on the outside. Greater is he that's in this me than he that's in this world. But we don't always do that. We collapse to the pressure around us and go, Well, I know one day, one day Jesus will call my name. As days go by, I hope it never stay the same. And God said, Whoa, 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 whoa. I ain't getting no realer to you than you are right now. That heat's on, go turn it on. It's too hot. Just go flip it off. It's hot in here to me too. So when you grab, grab a hold of the grace of God and you start realizing we could go a lot farther with kindness than we could doctrine. 
Amen? Kindness will call people and keep them. If people come in and say, well, well, do you believe in this? And what do you believe in that? What do you believe in? All of a sudden, they won't come back because there's no relationship. It's a legalistic ship. I don't want to be in a legalistic ship. I don't want to get with people that i got to sit there and correct you and guide you and lead you by law. I want to accept you by the grace and the mercy and the favor of God that you're chosen, you're elect, you're holy, you're righteous, you're upright, not because I can even see that. It's because he said that. See, when we build our life on the grace of God, none of us could live a life apart from that and have success. Can I get an amen? See, in the kingdom, the higher you go, the less pressure there is to affect you negatively. How much pressure is there you're seated next to Jesus in the heavens? Right there at the throne of God, right next door to to God the Father, and here's Jesus, and here's you. How much pressure is hell going to put on you right there? None, zero. Well, God said, why do you not see that I wrote that through Paul, said that you were seated with me in the heavenlies? That ought to put an immense pressure inside you to say, how dare you, devil? How dare you mess with me? It ain't just a scripture. It's food. It's manna. I got that in my chest. I'm going to refuse. I'm going to reflect. I'm going to just knock it down, repel anything that tries to stop me from entering in and possessing what God says is mine. It's the only place you and I have the right to be selfish. I refuse to not receive what God says belongs to me. His benefits are yea and amen, not all me. 2 Corinthians 3, 7. It says... But if the ministry of death, written and engraved in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. And look, it's great. Moses had the glory of God where? On the outside. And he had to cover his face because they saw the darkness in their life and the light that shone from him. And therefore, he had to cover his face. But it says that this glory of his countenance, which was the glory, was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation, the ministration of what? Everybody say that. Be glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness exceed in glory. Look, anybody can see sin. Anybody can get around someone and see it. There's blind sin. There's open sin. There's hidden sin. And there is unconscious sin. That's the atomic nature that lives inside all of us. And, you know, when you realize that open sin, anybody can see. If I come in here and said, ah, blankety-blank this and blankety-blank that, you go, oh, that, that's sin. What are you doing? But then if it's blind sin, it's something that I'm not aware of. I don't have a revelation of that in Scripture. And once I get a revelation of that, then it is for me to repent and say, you know, God, your word said that. I was wrong. Forgive me. Then he said there's hidden sin. That's the sin that nobody knows but me. And you know, fin- sin's fun for a season. But then comes destruction. God does not want us to learn from the devil. He wants us to learn from himself. The difference between what we discovered in our life today was when Adam sinned, he went from being a learner to a discerner. We shouldn't have had to discern between good and evil. Discernment came from disobedience. If we would have just learned and listened to God, everything would be yea and amen. He would have taught us about good and evil in its time. I mean, like me going into the 
children's room in there with the three and four years old and give them some condoms and explain what they are and what you do with them. That's what our government wants to do at the K-4 and K-5 level. They want to go in and teach the children sex. Pre-kindergarten. Let me tell you something. We have got to get back to the place where the word of God is the ministration of life, not the ministration of death. And so, therefore, that stuff will cause those children to go out and get involved with stuff that they'll be full of guilt and full of sin. A woman called me the other night want to know about abortion. And well, isn't that little piece of protoplasm? It ain't nothing. I mean, you know, it's just, well, but if it is a child, will, will I know it in heaven? Will it, will it be? I said, yeah, you'll know it. That child was a child. It, it don't make no difference, you know, what you did or how, how, what happened to it. God didn't forget it, and it'll be there. But guess what? It'll have no condemnation on you. You'll get to heaven, and that child will say, hey, Mom, I'm so glad to meet you. Why? Because God is not a condemning God. Condemnation comes from the law to make men see they were sinners. All of us have judged somebody. All of us have condemned somebody. Well, yeah, I don't like you. Oh, I love so-and-so. I don't like you. Why? Because we are pre prejudiced and bigoted by self-interest. And God says, that's got to go. If you want my grace and mercy to flow, if you want my blessings and benefits to overtake you in a way, then you've got to see the grace of God is the only way. Grace is all we have to offer. Mercy is all we have to offer. Condemning and putting Obama down, putting the government down, putting anything down is wrong. They're only following their father, the devil. They don't know any better. Why are we condemning people that don't know the truth? Jesus said, if my word abides in you, then you would know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Now, I call you freedom fighters. I want you to work and live for freedom, to set people free, not bind them up. Remember, you, you cause a little one to stumble. He said, it's wor worse that you put a millstone on your neck, you're thrown in the deepest part of the ocean. Because why? God didn't come to destroy. He come to save. Amen? Listen, when you see what God is saying here, He said, but if the ministration of death written and engraved in stones was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away with, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? What is more glorious than to look at a sinner and say, God loves you so much. You are so special. They want to hit you with a rock. Because why? They're under the law. They're condemned but not by us. There ain't no condemnation. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Seeing that we have such hope we use great plainness of speech. Plainness means it's just easy. It flows. It's on a level keel. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which was abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Do you realize that even though they don't have a temple anymore and that they don't cover their head, their hearts are still covered? When the Jewish men and women still try to worship God through Moses, they still are under a veil. Their hearts are, are blinded. They can't understand Messiah has already came. Now, the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in the glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even by the spirit of the Lord. Do you realize that the Lord's telling you what glory to glory means is, look, you don't have to ask God for glory. It's already inside you. 
Jesus is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. You know what grace is? Mercy. God's mercy is tied to you for the whole per time you're on this earth. Grace is God's position of favor and love for you, not based on you and your performance. It's based on the truth that God loves me. That's weak. You see, what, what the law tries to do is dissolve what Jesus did. If you keep examining yourself through the law, then you will stone yourself. But if you'll examine yourself by the grace and favor of God, then you'll say, God loves me. I asked an, it was an 86-year-old man one time, taught, taught the Word of God for 60-something years, and asked him, Sir, what great revelation, out of all the years you've been preaching the gospel, what is the greatest revelation that you know? Oh, that's easy. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. I see your faces. You remember when you were children, this I know. It just seems so wonderful. You weren't as full of junk as you are now. But you should listen and sing it the same way. Because you do. You love me. You love me. You died for me. I don't know about birds. I don't know about candy. But I know. Does he love you? I didn't hear you. He loves you. You see, if you, have, if you can't believe that, the devil will say, why? You're a liar. Look at your life. Look what you did last night. Look at this over here. And, and you know what you've got to do? Did I do something last night? No, I didn't. Father, forgive me. I'm sorry I did that. And I thank you, God, according to 1 John 1, 9. I'm confessing that sin, and you're faithful and just to cleanse me and forgive me. Therefore, I'm clean as white snow. Thank you, Lord, for it now. Thank you, devil. Where'd you go? Huh? Tell me some more stuff that I got wrong. You're going to be my best friend, devil, because you're going to show me what's wrong with me so I can repent and tell God to forgive me, and now that's put under the blood because I will not enter into the ministry of death. I will walk in the ministry of life. I will be a life-giving person to bless somebody else's life with because God blessed me so much. See, patience is the art of living unresponsive to pressure. How about I say that? Patience is the art of living unresponsive to pressure. You don't know what I'm facing them all. You don't know what's coming down. Patience is the art of living unresponsive to pressure. What you're doing is saying, God's not really there for me. Yeah, but you know, I, 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 there ain't no yell but to it. When you see a but, you start listening to it. But if there's no but, don't put it there. Always remember, but sting. I'd rather be closer to the head than the tail. So therefore, you've got to constantly remind yourself and say this. Once you tell the devil, you know, devil, I'm not going to fight you. I'm not going to justify myself. You're right, I did that. I'm sorry. I called a woman this morning and repented to her because I was rude to her in a, in a public arena, and, and I went. She didn't even remember me doing it. I said, don't matter if you remember. I did. I remember. Why? Because if not, that's still the product of the ministry of condemnation. You know the only reason why you resent someone is because you want their attention to be better toward you than it is, and then you feel inferior, you feel insecure. And then all of a sudden, the devil comes, yeah, you know what they did to you? Did you see this? Yeah. Oh, and then you try to justify yourself. You try to think, well, now, now you know, I, I might have been wrong there, but really I was only 80% 80, 80 wrong. 20% was, I was agged on. What you're doing is trying to justify yourself. The quicker you, God told me to write a book, says, the art of enjoying wrong. You go, what? I said, he said, James, listen. The reason my children will not repent and take responsibility of what they're wrong for is because they're still trying to say, I'm not wrong. You don't know the whole story. 
No, I just know there's a conflict, so why don't one of you jump in and say, I'm sorry, forgive me, Lord, and you let it go. Then the joy unspeakable comes because God said, I can back you because you know what? All of you are wrong. Ain't nobody right. I didn't come to bring the ministry of right. I didn't come to just drag people away from the ministry of wrong. He said, I come to get you free from that theology. I want you to look in grace and favor and say, you represent grace and favor. You're not perfect. You never will be. But you do represent my grace. You do represent my kingdom. You do represent my son. God woke me up this morning and was talking to me like that. And he showed me. He said, there's one thing that you've got to really understand. He said, Adam was born to be a learner. Everybody say to be a learner. But when he failed, he now became a discerner. He should have never had to discern between good and evil. Should have been, hey, Colonel Sons, it's over here. Oh, it's good. Thank you, Dad. Thank you, Dad. Thank you. It wouldn't have been no discerning. Well, is that good or is that bad? Is that right or is that wrong? Is that high or is that low? Well, and, and look how confused and distorted we get trying to get ourselves back to Dad and let Dad just be the voice talking to our life. Daddy wants to talk to you. Oh, thank God for Brother Benson, but he said, Daddy wants to talk to you. You don't need another preacher. Go, oh, my preacher. Oh, he's so great. No. He said, your father, which is in heaven, is great. Look at him and say, Father, thank you. Talk to me, Dad. Here I can bring my problems. You know, the ministry of death will not let you come in the presence of God. But the ministry of life says, don't care about what the ministry of death says. Come walk in here boldly. Let me tell you something, the Old Testament, the Old Testament is a type and a forerunner of things to come. I don't have to go back to the Old Testament and consult shadows. I have to go in the new and consult the king himself. You can come boldly before my throne and petition me anything. Why do I got to go back and get a type and shadow? Well, Joseph, what did he do back there? Well, he wasn't under our covenant. Our covenant is yea and amen, not oh me. Our covenant is I am born again. I am completely forgiven. I am a grace child. I walk in peace, love, and joy. And if anything that I have a challenge with, Daddy, hello. Oh, God's too busy to mess with you. No, he's not. He said he's right there. He's your ever-present help in the time of your trouble. He'll never leave you or forsake you. But we've got to accept that in our heart and not let the ministry of death, that condemning spirit, jump on us. Can I get an amen? See, we need to quit praying for God to show us his glory. You need to start saying, Jesus is the glory of God, and Jesus is in my heart. So the glory of God is on the inside of me. Hey, look, at, look at the ministry of this in John 8, 1. Now, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came in to hear him. And he sat down, and he taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her at the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses is in the law. So what did they bring? Stones. They already were prepared to execute her. Now Moses in the law commands us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou you? This they said, tempting him that he might have to accuse him. And Jesus stood down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. Sometimes you need to exercise patience before you act. That's what Jesus did. These guys busted into his meeting. Walk right in the midst of him like you're nothing. And threw this woman down and started him being challenged off. He said, so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Silent. Why? Jesus was waiting for an answer from his father. He said, I do nothing, but I hear my father say. So sometimes when you're quiet, doesn't mean you're just being rude. It's meaning you're listening. 
God, what would you have me say? I don't know why this thing's come to me today. How do I address it? Because if I don't address it right, then they're going to look at me like I'm the bad guy. I've helped many a person, and all of a sudden I overloaded my lip trying to help them, and all of a sudden, guess what? I was the bad guy. There's something that you've got to learn how to listen to God and let him talk when he's ready. He said, and they which heard it, being convicted by their own consciences, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. And Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman. And he said unto her, Woman, where are those things, those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Jesus was showing her grace over law. Jesus said, woman, you're no different than any other human being. All of us sin and come short. I don't, but you do. But I am the Savior of the world. I am the one who came from my father that knows his will. See, they brought the law to him to try to trap him. But he fell silent and he waited for a word from his father. This pressure was put upon him while he was preaching. He did not respond to the pressure. He responded to the word of his father. Stone her or don't stone her. They thought Jesus would break the law and condemn himself. Jesus, when pressured for response, just said nothing. Listen, you don't always have to respond to your accuser. I don't have to. He exercised patience. He waited for a word from his father. Grace is something you need to see has already been supplied. We need the grace of God in everything we do. Everything we do. For by grace are we saved through faith and not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. There are five arenas that grace you'll find in your life. Grace is conditional. Grace is positional. Grace is locational. Grace is proportional. Grace is theological. In 1 Corinthians 3.10. It says, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man work abide which is, has been built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If a man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Do you realize that many things you're going to do in your life that maybe God didn't grace you to do, but you tried anyway and you failed? God won't throw the baby out with the bathwater. God's not going to look at you and say, well, you tried, and then you're ashamed of yourself because you didn't mark, you didn't make it. God said, a righteous man falls down seven times, and he always gets back up. Why do you keep judging yourself? I judged you at the cross. I have called you redeemed. I have called you forever forgiven. Your name is the Lamb's Book of Life. Why do you remind yourself of failure when you ought to remind yourself of my victory? What did I do for you? What did I make real to you? I want you to walk in that. You see, Paul, when, what we see in Galatians 3.10 here, uh, I mean in uh, 1 Corinthians 3.10, same thing we see in Galatians 2.21, was called apostolic frustration. Paul had the grace to do what he did. And Paul went into Corinth, and he started a church. And that church became huge and successful. Paul could have sat down on his laurels and said, Man, this is awesome. I got this beautiful place on the side of the, the Asian Sea. Man, I can sit out here and enjoy myself and just rejoice in my And I can sit here and be old here one day and have this great church to, to lift up and praise God. 
But guess what happened? The grace lifted. When the grace lifts, you become frustrated. Things start not working out. Things start getting crazy. All of a sudden, Paul starts saying, what is wrong with you? He said, I can't speak to you as men, but as babes, because you're carnal. Paul now was seeing them through the flesh instead of seeing them through the spirit, and so it was time for him to go. So he got on a ship. He appointed a man to be the pastor over that church at Corinth, and he sailed over to, 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 to Ephesus. And then he started a church in Ephesus. Why? The grace lifted there and met him over there. Now then, he left the position here, and he went over to the position there. Now guess what? He was no longer the pastor of the church at Corinth. He was the father of the church in Corinth. And whenever he traveled back there, they received him as the father. Someone that was an apostle, someone that loved them, and he had the heart for them. Is why he birthed that church in the spirit. Then he went to, to had to uh, do it in Ephesus. Then it said he left Ephesus and he went to Philippians. He went to Philippi and he started one there. Then he went to Thessalonica and he started one there. And the, all the journeys, he was depositing churches and raising men up, but the grace was upon him. The grace is what gave him the ability to go before uh, uh, Rome and, and teach the gospel there at Rome for 10 years until finally the grace lifted and said, now you're coming home. And he got up and he said, well, I've ran the race, I've kept the faith, and now my time of departure is at hand. He greeted everyone. He told them, go see your brother Timothy, go see this, go see that, tell everybody this and that. And then, bam, he went in the next room and they cut his head off. He was just being transferred. And what, look, death is not death to you and me. It's transfer. All of a sudden, you're going to transfer from one glory to another glory to the full glory. And it ain't, well, I messed up. God says, how could you mess up? Well, you know, God, I let you down. He said, you're not holding me up. I'm the glory and lifter of your head. You're not the glory and lifter of my head. Sometimes we get to pity in ourselves. A little pity party's going to God saying, I pity. Accept my power. Walk in deliverance. Walk in freedom. Keep yourself upright. See, the ability to receive from God is conditional. It's always conditional. It's conditional on you accepting and embracing what he said. See, Paul's mandate was to give away what God had given to him. What God speaks to you, you must embrace or there'll be no grace to do it. So embrace the grace. Everybody say that. Don't look at it through your natural ability, to your natural strength. Look at it through God's grace that God took you out of the ditch. He made you a switch and told you to beat the devil up and get him out of your face. He has no right to you. He has nothing to do to you. And just say, thank you, Jesus. I'm going to, through that name, conquer and overcome and be victorious. It don't matter what the devil says. It matters what God said. God's not going to consult the devil about you. So why do we? What God calls you to do he graces you to do. You have the grace to be here with me and, and Debbie in this little church in Lamarck, Texas. To raise up a church that can reach the world. It takes a lot of grace. It takes the ability of men and women with gifts and talents and, and abilities and strengths to say, yes, Lord, I see the vision, I see the purpose, and that's to reach the unreach and tell the untold. It's not how size we are or how much we got or we have bands or we have everything. Else. It says those things shall come. And when the grace of God supplies it. But right now, you've got the hottest preacher on planet Earth sitting here preaching every night. I mean, you've got someone here that's going to bring you up and not tear you down. Somebody's going to be the glory and the lift of your head because I know the glory so I can tell the story. I love this. God loves, is, God's love, y'all say this to me, God's love is beyond Human explanation or definition. God knew you before you knew you. And you can't define yourself. I, w I look back and I say, how could God take me where he took me from and got me here? I mean, I have friends I see all the time, man, you ought to be dead. 
all that stuff you went through in your life, and the junk I knew you in high school, I knew the stuff you went through. Man, you ought to be dead. And here you are up here preaching the exalted king and representing his kingdom. And, man, you know that makes somebody go, you know, God saved Benson. There might be hope for me. But I know that dude. He was horrible. And that girl, I was in a shooting gallery one night. And I, I had a rig in my arm and I was so messed up. And I, pulled, I, I passed out with my coagulated guitar had a bar on it. And I started singing. And I just couldn't have it. And here I am sitting there in that tent and it's all messed up. And this girl was in there and she saw me. And she remembered the story of my bank account. And I, I got flea by the tip of the tip of the I had to go to the hospital. And, you know, she saw me in church 10 years, 12 years later. She stared at me the whole service. I could feel them eyeballs piercing me. I thought, my God. She came up to me at church. was right there. Boom, like just manifest herself right next to me. What are you doing here? Praising God. What are you doing here? Man, last time I saw you, you was in, in that place. And, man, it was just ugly. It was bad. I didn't think you was alive. What a good God we serve. And I walked away and never saw her again. But I never forgot it because along your journey in life, you're going to run into people that's going to remember the old you. And all of a sudden, they're going to know that you are defined by the new you, that there's a definition that God put in you. And along with that definition comes a position. See, the enemy, he can't stop you from getting saved, but he can stop you from being used. He can get you to a point that you don't think you're good enough or you're not strong enough based on your own merit and your own work, and all of a sudden you won't put your hand to a plow, you won't do anything, and you sit back and just sit back. And God said, that's the enemy. I said, you're going to go from one glory to another glory to another glory. My glory is one day I'm sitting there teaching in front of 5,000 people and praising God. The Holy Ghost is smacking everybody and getting them all like it used to be back in the early days. But God says, it's transition that you go from one glory to another. That means sometimes the journey takes you into places that you don't feel like you can do anything. But guess what? That's where God's grace comes up and says, you can't, but I can. You better learn to trust in my grace. My grace is sufficient, Paul said. Lord, these three demons, they, these demons are bugging me. They won't let go of me. They're always on top of me. Lord, please remove them. This minister of Satan sent to buffet me. said, nope. What do you mean, no? Paul, my grace is sufficient. Everybody say that. Say it again. Say it again. Any demon from hell that sits up in your face and tells you, you need to say, my grace is sufficient. Oh, you don't understand that? Can I explain it to you? Where are you going? Where you... Because why? It's the grace of God. It's why you and I are sitting here tonight, not dead. It's the grace of God why we're not in some jail right now. It's the grace of God why we're blessed and taken care of. It's the grace of Woo! I got the grace. How about you? You see, when we walk in that grace and favor, then all of a sudden we start commanding things to come our way. See, the world calls God's grace luck. Oh, you're just lucky. God's grace. That God's grace is the ability to do the impossible through no effort or ability or talent of my own. It's the grace of God. You just need to just follow grace and say, Oh, Jesus on the main line, tell him what I want. If you're sick and you want to get better, Got to be jacking it up. And, Man, if I'm sick and I want to get better, tell him what I want. No, I don't want to bother you. Dad, stay there and die. But if you get up and say, this stuff is a lie. I don't need Dr. Zeus. I don't need Dr. Moose. I don't need Dr. Goose. I need Dr. Jesus. I need to see what the gospel says. The gospel is the too good to be true news. I have seen so many people on deathbeds that are now glorifying God 15 years later and going, look what the Lord has done. 
I was told I was going to die. But guess what? Somebody lied. If I hadn't seen miracle signs and wonders out of my own eye and been a part of them, then you know what? I know that God imparted to me a gift to reach out and touch somebody. He didn't say to use it for myself. He said to use it for others. And all of a sudden, I've seen people in horrendous situations. That couple we were praying for, they're out of the hospital. Both of them. They didn't die. There's a liar and there's the truth. And you have to consult it. And when you think you're not worthy to have it, you say, grace. Everybody say, grace is always sufficiency. Grace always will make a way for you. And if you won't consult grace, then you're going to try to find it somewhere else. And I just like Paul said, once he established that victory, that grace was all he needed. No one could forbid him to preach the gospel anywhere on earth. No one. Well, I'm that same demon. Yeah, but you ain't got no power now. I'm going to pass you. I'm going to do what I want. That voice got lesser and lesser and lesser until the voice didn't mean nothing. Condemnation rules over most of the Christians, rules over them, stomps them down, persecutes them, afflicts them, and they don't want to get up and say, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord hath made. Every time I call Cindy, I always sit there in the morning, we sit there and start singing on the phone. Why? Because if I don't make a decision in my heart to say, this is the day the Lord has made, and I will, I will, I will rejoice and be glad in it. Say, I will. will. See, you don't get up in the morning and say, well, I'll consider. No, you make a mark before you get up and say, this is the day the Lord has made, and I have a reason to be here because he woke me up and I'm not dead. So I got something that needs to be said. And so I'm going to get up and put myself into gear. And then manifestation is going to flow. Look, it's not going to be going to preacher big. It's going to go to a believer. That outpouring in this last day is going to be on the believers. Believers are going to go lay hands on the sick and they're going to recover. All of a sudden the anointing is going to come. Prophetic words will come to your mouth. All of a sudden, Brenda, you're going to hear prophecies come out of your heart. You're going to hear it when you're talking to someone. And the Holy Ghost is going to put words in your mouth. And those words are going to cause you to declare them and decree them, or you're going to sit on them. And God said, do not sit on anything I put in your heart to give away. Speak it. Because God said that's releasing your faith, and it's causing God's grace to have a place to work. Grace come to you first through faith. Grace provision can't come any other way but faith. It's got to be believed in your heart, released with your mouth, and it comes real. I'm, I am living prophecy that people have spoken in my life that guided me so I could get past me because I had a road map to look at what someone prophesied over my life. And I would never let go of it, and I still never let go of it. And I keep walking it until it's completely fulfilled in all the different prophecies that were given to me. And I can't forget them if I want to. I tried to. They just keep popping up. Because God wants us to be a success. God wants us to be more. Let's look at it. Grace is conditional. It's based upon his will and what he wants to provide in your life. Grace, it's positional. That you are right where you need to be wherever you're at. When you hear something to give to someone, grace is in. Deny yourself, open your mouth and speak. It's locational. Wherever you're at, God can be a minister of grace to someone wherever you're at. It's proportional. You will never understand grace if you're not working with grace. Quit trying to develop gifts and talents to put you forward. Just get motivated by the grace of God and to get closer and closer to the unmerited favor, God's willingness to use his power on your behalf. He doesn't, he's not upset because you stand up and sound like an authoritative person from God. You don't have to have a pulpit. You are a pulpit. It's theological. God's grace will change your theology. I used to condemn everybody, judge everybody, and the more I walk in grace and favor, I realize how stupid is as stupid does. That I thought I had the ministry of condemnation, or I had the ministry to change everybody. And all of a sudden, I was doing more harm than I was good. Because why? 
God wants grace. And a lot of times when you can even condemn people to make them ashamed and feel guilty themselves and walk away, you know what? God should still use that. All of a sudden, they'll go to God, cry, and say, God, that person said that. They didn't know what they were doing. Just ignore it. Don't worry about it. I love you. Everything is to try to be relational. Everything is to try to get you to go to God and sit down yourself and talk to him. And then when he tells you something, don't go tell somebody. Because if you do, they go, ah, you ain't got that. Man, I know you. Yeah, you did. That sounded good. I, I bet you were over there benching the church. You see, you need to hear God and obey nothing else. You study the word of God till you can hear the voice of God. Then once you hear the voice, the voice of God, you confer not with flesh and blood ever again, and you get the job done at all costs. Just get up and get going and say, God, thank you. I'm renewed in the power of my mind to be restoring people, to be setting people free, that we're going to bring people to the house of God here at this church, and we know our pastor, and we know his wife, and we know this ministry, and we know each other. And God, all of a sudden, the glory starts falling in this building, and the glory starts reaching through and touching people and affecting their lives, and bam! There ain't enough room in here. What's all these people here? Where are they coming from? Because the world needs a kind word. The world needs somebody not to judge them, but to love them. Let's all stand. Praise God. Father God, I could preach for 10 hours. And I just thank you right now for that anointing that's in this room. I thank you, Lord God, that each one of us are transferring. We're saying, God, I'm giving you the place that I've been in in exchange for the place that you're taking me to. That, Lord God, I do believe we go from one glory to another glory to another glory. That, God, we start recognizing Jesus is very much alive on the inside of us. Each one of us. That, Lord God, there's a supernatural abundance of grace and favor applied to the name of Jesus. And those who will exercise its authority will see revelation. They'll see impartation. They'll see delegation. They'll see association. And, God, they will see the kingdom has come, and it lives inside each other. Each one of us are kingdom kids. Bless this week, Lord God. Let us be nourished and fed and upright before you and go into this next Sunday ready and excited for a harvest Sunday, a great time of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, that men and women are going to come that need salvation, that need something from God, not just to hear something. And Father God, we call this a church of receiving because it's a church of that's believing. We give you all the praise for it now, Father, in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. Praise.